We have water. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Authors at Wharton. <laughs> so delighted to have Annie Duke. Annie, welcome. Thank you for having me. I would just like to, before we start, point out that uh, my research assistant on the book is sitting right here. So, so uh, that's, this is Antonio. Big hand for him. So, Annie, are you a quitter? Total quitter. So you're I'm not both. I'm a quitter and a gritter. Because, obviously, like, the thing is that you can't be, you can't succeed at something if you haven't stuck to it. So, obviously, I was very successful in poker, for example, so I stuck to it. Uh, but I'm also like a humongous quitter. And I think that's a little bit the point, right? Is that one or the other isn't a good thing to be. You need to be both. Okay, so if I'm not thrilled with this conversation halfway through, I can just, just walk. Go. Good. Walk out the I'm door. I'm glad I have the author's I will permission. Endorse, endorse. Excellent. So take us back to the beginning. Why did you get interested in quitting? I know that you were doing a degree at, I don't know, some, some Ivy League school some, in some Pennsylvania. School in and you dropped out of our PhD program here at Penn. Why did you quit? Okay, so. <laughs> did you all know that, by the way? Okay, yeah, serious quitter, right here. A total quitter. This could be Dr. Duke. Well, that's true. And will be Dr. Duke very that soon. That is also true. Um, okay, so I did five years here across the way in Solomon at, uh, in the psychology department. Um, so uh, for people who are familiar with PhD programs, five years, it's like, what? Because that means I'd already done all the work for my dissertation. I've passed my qualifying exams. In fact, I was on the job market. I was, uh, I was ready to do all my job talks. You're insane, but go on. Well, uh, so I, actually, there's a really good lesson here. Uh, there's two lessons here. So um, I got sick. And I ended up in the hospital for a couple weeks. And it was right when I was supposed to be giving all of my job talks. So I was, uh, first of all, I had to cancel those because, you know, those are seasonal anyway. So I'm going to have to wait until the next year because I'm just at that point not healthy. And um, I need money. So I was uh, on a fellowship. I didn't have it anymore. Um, I, you know, my dad's a school teacher, so he wasn't really going to be able to help me much. And so I just needed money. And that's how, that's when I started playing poker. And I loved it. I really did all the things that I was studying. So Penn at that time was really kind of uh, one of the very first what you would call cognitive science programs, right? Where it was very interdisciplinary. We were really thinking about how those disciplines spoke to each other in terms of how the human mind interacts with the world and processes it and models it. And that's what I was working on. And then here I'm sitting at poker and it's just like a real life, high paced, you know, fast paced, high stakes version of what I was studying. And I just loved it. And I ended up not going back and defending. Um, so first lesson is sometimes you're forced to quit, not voluntary, and uh, it forces you to explore options that you otherwise might not explore. And while it doesn't always work out, sometimes it does. And I think there's a really important lesson in that that we can talk about about opportunity cost uh, and how you can neglect that if you aren't forced to. Uh, but the other thing is that um, the thing about quitting is it's about reversibility. And even decisions to quit are reversible because just as of about two months ago, I am now enrolled as a graduate student in the psychology department at the University of Pennsylvania. Woo! So, yeah. we, just, we just had to wait a few decades. Just had to wait a few decades. And uh, so I should, I should have, I should, so hopefully successfully defend my dissertation sometime at the beginning of 2023. That's we're, the plan. We're definitely excited for that. <laughs> So talk to me about the early experience of poker. I think obviously there's, I think every blurb you had on this book had to be edited because we all wrote, it's important to know when to fold them. <laughs> well, and then true. your editor was like, wait, the other blurber said that too. Yeah. But poker is, I think, the quintessential game for understanding when to, when to quit. And so talk to us about how you learn those lessons. Yeah, so it, I, yeah, poker, um, I think poker is such a good demonstration of the importance of skilling up on exercising the option to quit. So in poker, there's sort of what you would think of traditional quitting, which is like I'm playing in a game and I get up and I cash out and I leave. We kind of, that's sort of what we would generally think about in quitting. But in game theory, we talk about loss cutting. And cut, cutting your losses is a form of quitting. In poker, that expresses as folding your hand. So I get the hand, that means I've started it, and now I choose to stop it and I fold. 
And when you look at what is it that separates the elite players, the, the professional players who really are like great and making money at it from uh, the amateurs, it's this how good are you at exercising that option to quit? So what you'll see is a, a few things. Is the first is in a game like Texas Hold'em. Is everybody familiar with Texas Hold'em, where you get yeah, so you get dealt two cards, and um, so uh, a, a full game of Texas Hold'em has nine or ten players at it. You get dealt two cards to start, and what you'll see is that professional players will play about fifteen to twenty percent of those two cards starting, starting combinations. So this is like right off the bat. Before you've seen any other cards, they're folding somewhere between 75 and 85% of the time. That is a lot of quitting, right? Whereas amateurs are playing over 50% of the two card combinations that they're dealt, sometimes up to 80%. It kind of depends on the game that they're playing. And so that's like a really big distinction where amateurs are quitting much less than professionals are even right off the bat. But then as you get deep into the hand, what happens? You're betting you have money in the pot, right? So now we're starting to build up some debris that makes it very hard for us to let go of things. Uh, and what you'll see is that pros are pretty good at just sort of folding because what they're thinking about is uh, given the new information I have, and that's two forms, the new cards that have come down, that tells me something about like how my hand is relating to the cards or how I think it might be relating to my opponent's hand. And also, you might have raised me, for example, like you might have upped the ante uh, or doing things where uh, you're telling me information, where your actions are allowing me to know something about what you're holding, and I'm learning that information as well. So I've got, you know, these two streams of information that are coming in. And sometimes they tell me things are not going well for me, at which point that means that if I continue to bet money going forward, I am not going to be betting with a positive return on investment and I ought to just fold my hand. That is how a professional thinks about it. They're actually very good at sort of making those calculations. What does an amateur do? Well, I know because they say it out loud. I have too much money in the pot to fold now. So, okay, so that's good for me as a pro that you're saying that out loud nonetheless. Um, sometimes they'll say, well, it would have been too painful for me to see that I would have won the hand. So they'll continue that for that reason, because they don't want to feel the pain of like, if I had continued, I would have hit something that would have happened 2% of the time or something like that. So it's that sort of regret aversion wall. So, so they say all these things out loud, so we have a good idea of what's going on. But what that means is that they'll continue, and they actually will have a saying, which is, any two cards can win. And I always say, but you should add on to that, not enough of the time to be profitable. You forgot about the second <laughs> half of the sentence there. So, um, so they're just sticky. They're just much stickier than professionals. So people talk about uh, poker skill as like, you know, do you raise, do you do whatever? And it's like literally no. Like if the one thing that pros really do way better than amateurs is they just fold a lot. Well, that, I mean, is amazing that it's that simple, right? To go from amateur to pro to quit more. Well, I mean, there's other things. <laughs> That's all I have to do. Well, there's other things involved. Like, obviously, that, that mapping function that I said, right? Like, obviously, there's take skill for me to be able to map your actions onto, onto what your cards are. Uh, there, you have to memorize some game theory optimal tables. Like, there's some other stuff involved, obviously. Uh, but this folding thing is actually really important, so much so that, that um, when people get what we would call stuck in a game, uh, uh, which is the same as, like, if you were losing money in a stock, uh, you know, you can be losing money in a poker game, so we call it being stuck. Um, what you'll see from even people who have all those other skills is they'll start getting sticky. Uh, you know, for that feeling that I've got to get all this money back that I lost. So even professionals can be subject to these, uh, to these forces, separate and apart from the fact that they actually have great skill on a good day, right? So in order to be truly great, you have to sort of play the same whether you're winning or losing, and that's actually quite hard to do. But the great players are better at doing that. When we first met, I was struck by the fact that every world poker champion I've crossed paths with has advanced training in psychology or behavioral science. Because like, <laughs> you, Maria Konnikova, Liv Wait, is that, like a, is that like a selection bias? It might be. Maybe. I mean, maybe you're just drawn to the game. But I am curious about, I think we're all familiar with heuristics and biases and how they, they lead our decisions astray. And oftentimes that kind of sends us in a tailspin of escalation of commitment to a failing course of action. when We should have pulled the plug, but we didn't. Yeah. Um, hard thing is to recognize that in the moment. And I think one of the things that's amazing about your poker career is you were able to take that knowledge you had in your head and put it into practice in real time when the stakes were extremely high and you're under a lot of pressure. So how? 
Oh, gosh. Okay. So first of all, I just want to say, I think this is really important to acknowledge about any bias reduction strategies is I was bad at it. I was just better than other people. And I think this is really important to understand is that these biases really do have an, a really deeply adverse effect on decision quality. So we shouldn't have as a standard that uh, I'm going to act as if I were objective and perfectly rational. We should have as a standard, I want to do better than I would if I weren't trying a bunch of stuff. Uh, and if I do that, those, you know, you can grind out some pretty nice edges that way. Like if I can go from having an edge in a game that's 3% to 5%, that's, that's big. I mean, that's huge as you're doing that hand over hand over hand. Uh, and so that's kind of what our goal is, is to sort of not mess up as much as we otherwise would have. So uh, the way that I would do it was kind of like there were, um, there were essentially like three main strategies. The first one is that you really do train yourself just to be pricing out the hand, right? So what that does is it gets you to focus on the future less than the past because, uh, and it's not that like you're tricking your brain, it's that that's the only way that you could possibly think about the hand is through a pricing mechanism. So you're always keeping track of how much money is in the pot. You're always keeping track of what the probability is, which is a little bit of an estimate, a little bit not of your hand winning. Sometimes it's not an estimate in the sense that I know that I have nine cards that will make a flush. There's one card to come. That means I'm going to win about 18% of the time. There's not a lot of guesswork there. Sometimes it's about me comparing to your hand, then it gets a little bit more subjective, right? But I can get in the zone and then I can figure out if I'm getting an appropriate price from the pot. So notice I'm not thinking at all about anything that I have in there because my money is not mine. It belongs to the pot. And so it's only included in that sort of pricing equation. So that's like sort of a mechanical way that sort of of dealing with it. Um, I think that's a little bit unique to poker. I think it's hard to do outside of that particular environment. But the other two strategies that were really helpful was one, I was set a loss limit. Um, and so this is a pre-commitment contract in, in the book I, I call broadly this kind of tactic uh, to use kill criteria, which is to say, I understand that in the moment when I'm losing in a game, that I will not be particularly rational. So I don't want to be like those people who had all sorts of skills, but because they were stuck in the game, they started playing really badly, right? So I, I recognize that in other people, and then I know that that probably is going to happen to me as well. And if I understand that I'm going to be in a situation where I will be a poor judge for myself of why I'm winning or losing, because remember, it could be luck. And uh, in the battle between, like, uh, do I have to say I'm playing bad or do I have to say I got unlucky? Trust me, I got unlucky is going to win that battle. Um, <laughs> For me and everyone else. So if I know that I'm subject to that problem, then uh, what I'm going to do is just set up in advance that after I've lost a certain amount of money, I'm just going to get up and quit. Um, and I kind of figure out how much money am I willing to risk based on uh, is it an amount of money that I could reasonably expect to win on a good day? So that's how I set the loss limit. Because what I don't want to do is feel like I'm chasing something that isn't reasonable for me to get back the next day. So that's an example of a kill criteria, which is there's some set criteria. In this case, let's say, you know, I've lost $2,000. Um, and once I hit that mark, I have to get up and walk away. So, and then the third thing was to make really good use of quitting coaches. In other words, be accountable to other people for my behavior uh, and make those commitments out loud. So I didn't just set a, a kill criteria or a loss limit in my head. I shared it with people. And they knew that this was my goal in order to follow along with this. Uh, and that made me much more likely to follow through on that, to have outside help. So let's bridge from poker then to a lot of the quitting dilemmas in the room. OK. Um, we've got undergrads who are quadruple majoring, um, Ooh, who are taking seven classes, clearly need to walk away from some of those. Yeah, don't do that. We have, <laughs> <laughs> we have MBA students who are wondering already, should I drop out of investment banking or consulting recruiting? Um, we have executives who are wondering if they should quit their jobs. Um, where do you start on assessing that question? Oh, gosh. OK, so um, so here's, here's the dilemma that we have, right? Um, grit gets you to stick to hard things that are worthwhile. That's a really good thing. Uh, everybody should get Angela Duckworth's book. Uh, it's actually a really important quality to develop in yourself. But uh, notice I said hard things that are worthwhile. This is the key. Uh, the problem with grit when taken too far, which is our tendency, is to stick to hard things or not hard things that aren't worthwhile. 
Why? Because we just have a really strong bias against quitting as adults. Okay, so uh, kids, it's a little bit different, but once we get into adulthood, uh, there's decades, uh, decades of science that shows that we don't like to walk away from things. Um, and we'll do all sorts of rationalizations to convince ourselves that it's still worthwhile to continue. All right, so first rule of thumb is if you're thinking about quitting, it's most likely, usually not always, but usually past the time that you should have quit. <laughs> Wait, should we not be applying this to romantic relationships? <laughs> no, we should, actually. Uh, now, let me be clear. In a romantic relationship, there may be children involved, and so you need to think about their happiness as well. So let's assume that the romantic relationship is unencumbered okay, by, by certain things. But um, So part of it is actually if we take a romantic relationship and, and things have not been going well and you're unhappy and you're unencumbered, and you're thinking about quitting, what's the thing that stops people from doing it? Well, there's usually two things that stop people from doing it. One is I put so much time into it already, um, but that's like a poker player saying I have so much money in the pot uh, that, you know, because that, we, we think like, oh, I don't want to have wasted my time. Like I put so much time into it, I don't want to have wasted my time. But that time is gone. I mean, this is just the sunk cost fallacy. And what should matter is, is the next month or the next two months or the next year uh, going to be the actual waste. So we don't want to sort of take what has already been spent um, in order to motivate us to continue to spend more when it's not a worthwhile endeavor, right? So, so the first thing is like, oh, I put so much time in it. And the second is, what if I switch and I'm still unhappy? Okay, so that's another big one that stops us from switching. So I, I actually talked to a woman that kind of shows these two things, I think, pretty well, named Dr. Sarah Olster Martinez. And she had contacted me because she was struggling with a quitting decision. And this will help you with your quitting decision, I promise. Um, and lucky for her, I, I got on, I, like, I was like, I didn't just reply and say, oh, that's interesting, and give her some tips. I was like, can I get on a Zoom? Because I happen to be in the middle of writing this book. I was like, oh, you have a quitting decision. I'm writing a book about quitting. Let's talk. So she had been, um, she was an ER doc. Uh, she loved emergency medicine. Um, and she had been promoted to be a hospital administrator. So uh, she, at that point, was only doing about six shifts a month in the ER, which was her original love. She's doing hospital administration. Unlike the ER work where you finish your shift and you go home, you're done, uh, the administrative work carry, like, follows you home, and it's interfering with her life with her children. So when I talked to her, uh, you know, I kind of said, well, what's preventing you from quitting here? Uh, and she cited both things. She said, well, you know, but I put in so much training and so much time into, you know, my work, uh, all my years in medical school and, you know, res internship and residency and attending and, you know, so on and so forth. So that was that sunk cost problem. But then she said something really interesting because um, she had another job offer. She said, what if I take that job and I don't like that one either? So I thought, oh, this is interesting because she's told me that she really hates the job she's in. So what I did was to try to sort of refocus it, um, to try to reframe it in the same way I might at the poker table where I'm trying to think about the future a little bit more. So I said, okay, so let's imagine it's a year from now and you stayed in this job. What are the chances that you're happy? And she very quickly said 0% because this is something she'd been mulling over <laughs> for three years. <laughs> she, was, she was particularly worried, not just that she was worried about what other people were going to think and that she would be a failure and, you know, there's a lot of stuff going into this. So she says 0%. So I said, okay, um, so if you take this new job, uh, maybe it's not going to work out. I understand that you're afraid of that. What are the chances that you'll be happy in this new job? She says, well, I haven't done it before. I said, take your best guess. And she said, well, I don't know, like, I've interviewed there. It seems okay. I guess it would be like 50-50. And I said, okay. This question is 50% greater than zero. <laughs> and like a light bulb went off for her, right? Because I, I just was showing her these forces that are causing you to stick in this thing that you're miserable in aren't the right things to be thinking about, right? Like you just have to think about if my goal in life is to be on roads that, that make me happier, then staying on a road that is surely, like a dead certainty going to keep me unhappy, doesn't make any sense. And even though the other road is more uncertain, it's the type of uncertainty I should be seeking because I'm more likely to find happiness there. Anyway, she, she quit the next day, uh, wrote back to me, said, you know, it was all good. Her supervisors were really understanding. They actually felt like they had failed her, not like she had failed them. Uh, and last I knew, she was very happy. So 
That's one way you can think about quitting to help you. I thought this was going to take a dark turn. No. <laughs> and she hated it even more. No, no. But, 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 but the, you know what the interesting thing is? Even if she did, it would still make it the right decision. Because uh, this is a case where if it's a dead certainty you're going to be, continue to be unhappy in the thing you're doing, we ought to want to quit and go even if it is more uncertain. But as you know, we have something called ambiguity aversion. Uh, we would prefer the devil we know to the devil we don't. And we were seeing that a little bit in what was happening with her. Um, but I just got her to look at sort of what the opportunity was, right? Like, what are the chances? What's the probability of happiness associated with the new course? So talk to us about the situation where you quit and then you aren't happier. Because it seems like, I, I always think of Hemingway on that, that you can't get away from yourself by moving from one place yeah. to another. And I worry a lot that sometimes people are, I guess in Luba Mirsky and Sheldon terms, they're trying to change their circumstances when they should be changing their actions. Right. So look, I don't want you to just quit just because it came to your mind. I mean, I, I know I said if you're thinking about it, it's probably after the point that you probably should have done it. But that's OK. I still don't want you to do it that second. Uh, what I'd tomorrow. like you to do, don't do it tomorrow. No. Well, in, with Sarah Olson Martinez, it's very clear. But, but actually, it's one of the strategies I'm going to use because she came and talked to me. So this is helpful. So uh, in general, there's two things that you want to do. When we talk about kill criteria, what you want to do is set a limit on how long can I continue to, to sort of endure the situation that I'm in. So let's say that you're in a job where you're incredibly unhappy and you're feeling very unfulfilled. Um, what you would say is, how long is, is this status quo okay with me? Right? So let's say that you set a deadline of, say, three months. Uh, and now you say, okay, so let's imagine in three months that I decided that uh, things had changed enough that I want to stay. So write down, like, what are those things? What are the signals that I'm th seeing that tell me that things have turned around in some way that's satisfactory for me? And then likewise, set kill criteria and say, OK, imagine it's three months from now. What are the signals? What are the things that I'm seeing that would tell me that, uh, note, this is a persistent state that I'm in, and I should not be sticking around for this, right? And you can write those down as well. And then what you should do along with that is think about what would be the inputs to get you to the good outcome, right? So that's going to stop you from just sort of sitting and letting the world happen to you. Uh, maybe you have to go talk to your supervisor. Um, you know, think about uh, talking to other people in different functions, maybe talking to other people uh, who have similar roles at different organizations to see if, you know, is it a matter of the role or is just kind of your, are you just generally dissatisfied? So you can sort of figure all that stuff out through setting these deadlines for yourself that include these very clear criteria of what would cause you to do X or Y. Um, and then go get outside help. Go find somebody who is the right category of person to help you with the decision. It might be a mentor. It might be a therapist. It, you know, it might be a really good friend who really has your best interest at heart. Give them permission to really tell you the truth, which means that they may say to you, look, you know, you're going to carry your baggage with you wherever you go. Maybe that's what they're going to say to you. Or maybe they're going to say to you, look, you've been talking to me about quitting for the last year. I'm really tired of hearing it. You should have quit a long time ago. This is ridiculous. Quit and go get another job. But whatever it is, like get, tell them that it's OK to tell the truth. And that's going to help to create checks for both things, right? It's going to help you to create checks for quitting for the wrong reason. Uh, because setting the kill criteria and getting people to help you set that kill criteria and help to coach you along is going to really help you with that problem. But it's also going to help you get unstuck if that's the problem as well. I noticed you didn't say go to your parents. Was that deliberate? <laughs> well, your parents could be the right category. But your parents are a little bit you. So it a little bit depends on your relationship with your parents. You know, I mean, I, I tend to think that getting someone who's uh, less invested in you is probably better. And the reason for that is that, uh, and this I'm, I'm stealing from Danny Kahneman, who's a Nobel laureate. I like to steal things from Nobel laureates. I mean, not actual physical things, but things ideas. that they, ideas, thing that, things that they said. Um, and you know, what he says is the worst time to make a decision is when you're in it. So what does in it mean? It means when you're facing down the decision, carrying all of the sort of cognitive debris along with you, right? So when we think about escalation of commitment, it's a constellation of forces that are causing this to happen. Things like sunk costs, which we've already, already talking about, loss aversion, sure loss aversion, endowment effect, uh, omission, commission bias, status quo bias, uh, issues of identity, internal and external validity. We can go on. But I think we can award you your doctorate now, by the way. <laughs> well, at, at least my qualifying exam. So, um, so when we think about that problem, right, this is debris that we carry. 
So the nice thing about a mentor, for example, is they don't have that debris along with you. In other words, they're not in the decision along with you. But your parents really can be. And so your parents don't always make for the best quitting coaches because they're in it with you, right? So this is why if you think about kill criteria and quitting coaches, both of them are trying to help you to make that decision when you're not in it. So uh, when you set kill criteria, you're, you're thinking about, say, you know, two months ahead, that helps you not be in it. And when you go to a quitting coach, uh, that they're, they're not in it along with you. Because I'm sure you've, you've been in the situation where you see someone and you're looking at them, you're like, they should really quit. Because you can see it really clearly, but they can't. Um, but that's happening to you all the time, too. People are looking at you and thinking the same thing. So you want to go find those people to actually say that out loud to you. My other favorite approach in this kind of situation is, is to actually flip the roles and say, go find someone else who has a similar quitting dilemma. Yeah. Give them advice, and you'll generally find the advice that you give to others is the advice that you needed to take for yourself. I, I wish that was in my book. Now I'm sad. <laughs> There will be a paperback. Don't worry. <laughs> That's true. I can add it. To no, but we, I mean, we, we know that one of the, the yeah. psychological differences between advice giving and decision making is that in decision making, we're in the weeds. We're considering yep. way too many specific dimensions. Whereas when we give advice, we zoom out, we focus on the big picture, and yep. we're able to contextualize what really matters. Yeah, I, I agree. And so, yeah, if you can flip roles, if you can role play, what would you say to somebody who is in this situation? Actually, go to say it to someone who's in that situation. Those can all be incredibly helpful. I, you know, with the parent thing, I, someone told me a story recently. It's not in the book because it happened after, but I guess the paperback. Um, they said their parents were trying to instill grit in them as a child, which is a good thing, you know, to tell. Because kids can't always see what the reward is at the end, and so they'll just quit because they had a bad day. And you certainly don't want that to happen. That is not a good thing. Um, that would be bad quitting. Um, and so he said that his parents wanted him to play a musical instrument. And so they told him he could pick one. And he picked the saxophone. And he tried it. And he really, like, he hated the taste of the reed. Like, it was really, it was a horrible experience for him. Like, there was something about that that was just really abhorrent to him. Um, and his parents wouldn't let him quit. They, they made him keep going. And he said, not, I mean, first of all, I can't even listen to the saxophone anymore. But I ended up never, like, playing a musical instrument after that because it was so awful for me. And I think that's that, like, you can get too down in the weeds about, like, what are you being gritty about? Because obviously the, the right response a coach would have said, well, if you want uh, him to play a musical instrument and he really hates the saxophone, ask him what he's going to switch to. Right? And could it be piano, for example? Right? Like, think about what is the goal that you're actually trying to achieve. And don't make the saxophone the object of the grit, but make, say, you know, enrichment of some sort if you want to go really high level or, uh, you know, playing a musical instrument if you want to go a little low level. Like, make that the goal as opposed to the saxophone itself, which is broadly a problem that we have with goal setting anyway. But you can see there that the parents are sort of in it with him and unable to see what the appropriate response to that is. Or wonder if this is a business opportunity for flavored saxophone reeds. Something. <laughs> that would be, that might work. I mean, he, he said, like, when he, even when he hears the saxophone, he's like, you know, he just really hates it. So. Okay, so talk to us about the aftermath of quitting decisions. Um, I think it's really easy to evaluate them on the basis of whether we got what we expected. Um, but I read a book not too long ago called Thinking in Bets, oh. which you wrote. Oh, okay. It said we should beware of resulting. Yeah. and not judge our choices by the outcomes they get. Which, I have to say, on its face, if you stop there, sounds like a really dumb way to make decisions. Uh, <laughs> but as you dig into it, it becomes a really smart way to make decisions. So talk to us about the dangers of resulting and what the alternatives are. Yeah, OK, so, I, so here's the problem, is that if you have a very large sample size, then uh, if you get a result, you can say something about the quality of the decision. OK, so this would be a large end situation. The other thing is that if you take luck out of the equation, uh, then uh, you can judge a decision by the quality of its results. So as an example, if we played chess and you won, uh, that would mean that you made better decisions with me than I did. Um, even if nobody saw any of the moves in the game, we would know that you made better decisions than I did. Why? Because the, the, the pieces don't move when you like. there's no dice or anything like that. So we know that everything's moving. Uh, by an act of skill, right? So once we get into something that's pretty purely skill, um, then the outcome actually does tell you what sort of the quality of, of how you applied that skill was. Uh, but there's very few things in life that are actually very chess-like. Um, most things are much more poker-like, so there's lots of hidden information, which is also absent in chess. I know where all the pieces are, which is incredibly helpful. 
uh, for playing. Um, whereas in poker, the cards are face down, and obviously there's the element of the random deal, uh, which is different than chess. And when we get to that situation, uh, let's say that you and I played um, an hour of poker and you came out ahead and you don't know anything about me here because obviously otherwise I played better duh um, <laughs> are you saying you're gonna win <laughs> no that's the thing so let's say that you win um, if you don't see the game you actually can't say who played better assuming you, you don't know it's me but um, so uh, so that's the that's the issue that we have is that it's actually we make this really big mistake which is we work backwards from the quality of the outcome to get to the quality of the decision. When we're talking about small end situations with luck and hidden information, whenever there's uncertainty that it can exert itself on the outcome. Um, and that's something that we don't want to do. Uh, it's a simplifier. So uh, we'll go under kind of what Kahneman would say is a substitution, right? Well, it's really hard to figure out what the quality of the decision was, particularly in retrospect, but I can see that the ball got intercepted, right? So therefore, it must have been a really bad uh, play call. Um, it's kind of what we do. So that's a really bad error because um, it causes us to sometimes think that we made a bad decision when it was actually quite a good one. Um, and it sometimes causes us to make th think that we made a very good decision when it was actually quite a bad one. Have you ever heard, well, probably not so much now, but when I was growing up, uh, people would talk about how they drove better when they were drunk. They had a rationale for it, which is they were paying more attention because they knew they were drunk and really worried. Uh, but people would say that, um, and it was because they got home safely. You know, I mean, this, so this is a very good example of like where resulting can really go wrong. Um, but it happens like investing and investing all the time. Like you sort of invest with your gut and then you get a good outcome, maybe because the market just goes up. And then you think that somehow you have a system, right? And that happens a lot. Um, and so we want to be super careful about that problem. Well, this becomes a really big problem with quitting, partly because um, quitting, this problem of quitting interacts really badly with something called omission commission bias. So let me explain what those are, uh, which is also has to do with status quo bias. So let's say that I've already started something. Okay, so uh, well, when, so let's say I'm exploring two options, right? And I'm trying to think about what to start. I know that I'm going to start those under uncertainty. Uh, because there's going to be luck involved. I don't have a lot of information generally. Like think about, for example, hiring somebody, right? Um, what do you really know about them? You have a couple of references, a few interviews, and a CV. Like you, you don't know, know a lot. But luckily, we have the option to quit. Lucky for us. So now I start something. I hire someone, or I start a relationship. I start a project. start developing a product, uh, whatever it might be. Now I get some signals, and I start thinking maybe, maybe I ought to quit. Right? But here's the problem, and you can see this with Sarah Olson Martinez, is that the status quo, the path we're already on, when we continue on it, uh, it goes under omission, meaning we perceive it as making it sort of not doing anything, right? Like sticking with the status quo. Like we're not, we don't think that we wake up every day with an active, fresh decision to start that thing again today. We're just kind of on that path and going along, okay? Uh, but when we're thinking about switching, I want to quit my job and go to a new one. Maybe I want to break up and see what happens after that. That would be a co-mission. In other words, I'm, uh, we perceive that, we feel that psychologically as an active choice to stay, change from the status quo to something new. Okay, so good there. Got set up so far. Okay, great. So this is where the regret problem happens that really interacts badly, is that we know that there's all sorts of things that stop us from wanting to quit things, including sunk costs, that feeling of having wasted your time, those kinds of things. So that is already kind of making us want to stick to that status quo. But then there's a bigger problem, which is when we think about loss aversion, which includes sort of regret aversion or that anticipation of regret, it gets recruited for the starting decision, not for the status quo decision, at least not symmetrically. So. Uh, as you saw with Sarah Olson Martinez, we're very, very tolerant of bad outcomes that occur from just things we're already doing, but we are very intolerant of the anticipation of something bad that might come from switching. So that actually creates a huge bias against quitting, and you saw that with her. She was really miserable in her job. Why didn't she want to quit? What if I'm miserable there too? So you see this recruitment of loss aversion for the co-mission that isn't being recruited in the same way for the omission, but that also works in retrospect also. So, you know, as we sort of stay in the same job and don't have a great outcome, we're, we're more tolerant retrospectively of that than if we switch and get a bad outcome, we feel that regret 
more uh, intensely. And that then becomes resulting, mm -hmm. right? And so th these are the things that we're trying to avoid. Let's go to some audience questions. Okay. So we have a, a bunch that have come in. And. <laughs> oh, no, what? You're, what, you're laughing? Uh, would you beat Annie Duke at poker? Um, yeah. Would, would Annie win? No, you wouldn't win, because I have the wisdom not to play against you. There you go. <laughs> Um, okay, first serious question. Alex wants to know, Annie advises when to quit. Adam advises to think again. How do these two ideas coexist, and who's right? Why are you people so competitive? Really, yeah. Can't we both be right? Yeah. What do you think, Annie? So, I, I mean, I don't think that the two ideas are in competition at all, because I actually talk a lot about quitting beliefs and reevaluating your beliefs, right? So, one of the things that I, that I say, you know, pre, I hope pretty clearly in the book, is that... Um, you know, you, you, you believe something, you're on a path, you, those, that sort of is your system, um, and that we don't do enough reevaluation of that. So when I talk about forced quitting, for example, my having to be forced to quit my graduate program, that's when I did a, that's when I thought again, right? That's when I started to explore more. And I say, you shouldn't have to have an act of being forced to do it in order to think again and start to do that exploration. So beliefs are very much like things we do. Uh, they are our possessions or, uh, you know, or part of our identity. And we always need to be reevaluating that stuff, right? Like we cling to those things too much and we don't look at what the alternatives are, or the other things we can do. And when you do think again, sometimes you decide to stick and sometimes you decide to quit. So I'm not sure, like, I mean, if I, if you win, I win. And if I win, you win, I think, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on it actually as well. Cause maybe I'm just trying to make nice, <laughs> but <laughs> you might have to rethink that. Yes. Um, I no, I think we're in violent agreement here. Yes. I think what's most important is the process of questioning your intuition. Right. Um, I think we, we both subscribe to the idea that you shouldn't trust your gut. You should test your gut. Yes. And that's when you begin to discover, okay, is, it, is this a situation where it makes sense to grit or is it a situation where it makes sense to quit? And right. I think a lot of the rethinking we do doesn't necessarily give us a clear answer, um, but it allows us to be a little bit more informed about the question and the different trade-offs that we're making. Um, and I think that process matters more in, in some cases than the outcome because you're building the habit of making more informed decisions. Yeah, and I, and I think I would add to that that just as you said, uh, we're always going to be uncertain, right? Like, sadly, we know very little in comparison to all there is to be known. Um, so uh, after we start things or after we form a belief, there's going to be information discovery that occurs after the fact. And the, and the question really becomes, do you just stubbornly stick to that and never do any reevaluation? Or do you take time to actually examine your beliefs, think about what your assumptions are, uh, test them, so a lot of what I do, for example, in my business consulting, um, let's say, so I work with some, uh, some venture capitalists. Um, and when I came to them, they, it was sort of like, well, we just sort of like know a good founder when we see one. There wasn't a lot of process. And I said, well, I'm sure that your gut is awesome. So when you see it, I didn't, you know, I was like, I'm sure, like, you, you're pretty successful. But when you see a founder, can you tell me what are the things that your gut is, like when you're making that gut decision, what are the things that you're thinking about? And so we extracted that and made it explicit. And it was things that you would expect, like what's the quality of the market? Are there headwinds, tailwinds? You know, is it growing TAM? Uh, is the, you know, how, do you, how would you rate the founder? You know, is the team strong? Is there good product market fit? You know, these kinds of things. So it turns out you could actually kind of like itemize almost like a checklist what when they're going with their gut. It turned out that, they're sort of, you know, you can write down what it is that they're thinking about. We made that explicit and now you can interrogate that. And that allows us now to do data work to interrogate those assumptions and see if that works well. So, uh, you know, so I'm kind of with you on this one, I guess. There you go. <laughs> I'll take it. All right, next question. Oh, we have a bunch of questions. Okay, uh, how do you respond to social pressure of don't quit yet? Um, not necessarily only parental pressure, but um, peer pressure too, and how do you fight the urge to cave? Uh, yeah, that's a hard one. So we 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 have this issue of um, internal and external validity. So internal validity is kind of we want to see ourselves as consistent. We don't want to see ourselves as failure. We don't want to see ourselves as having made a mistake. So this is part of the problem with quitting is that we feel like if we quit, it means we made a mistake in the first place. Uh, to do it, that would be resulting, by the way, because uh, remember, there's uncertainty. 
Um, and so that, that's all occurring internally. It also happens to occur externally. Like, what are the ways that uh, we think that other people might view us? And that can either be stories that we tell ourselves in our heads, which generally will align with the things that we're worried about ourselves. But it could also be, for example, in a leadership capacity, leaders can lead in a way that exacerbates that issue of feeling a lot of, for example, career risk if you quit. Um, so a simple example, because leaders very often will, will um, manage to outcomes, is it causes people to stick in projects too long, uh, to continue developing products long past the point that you should walk away, um, to pursue sales leads long past the point that there's enough adverse signals that you shouldn't be pursuing it anymore, because they know that they're going to be interrogated if they let it go. Well, why did you fail? Why'd you shut this project down, right? So that what they what that want, makes them want to do is push against a dead certainty that there is no other choice but to walk away because then they don't get interrogated in the same way. So this is a little bit what your friends are doing to you in those kinds of situations. Um, and what I would recommend is you go find a better mentor because, because a lot of times when you're getting that kind of social pressure, it's because they're in it with you. And honestly, if you quit, what does that mean for their choices? So uh, that's why you have to find people who aren't in it with you. Like, go find a mentor who doesn't have the same kind of debris into the decision. And then when you do that, work it out. And then what you'll find is that once you actually do quit, they tend to be pretty kind to you about it. So um, how they're talking to you in the moment is generally protecting their own decision making. Uh, but when you walk away, they tend to be a little nicer. Unless they're a really bad leader, by the way. And that's a whole other thing for a leadership discussion. Some of these questions are, <clears throat> excuse me, a great fit for the lightning round. So okay, we're right. going to go there. Are you okay, ready? Yep. OK, best resource to learn poker. <laughs> I wrote a book called the Decide to Play Great Poker. So that's a really good one. But um, that's more about how to think through the game. But there's all sorts of solvers um, uh, which give you game theory optimal play. And I would suggest that you go find yourself a poker solver after you sort of get the general gist of the game. So read my book, go find a poker solver. You'll be pretty good to go. Where do you stand these days on reading people's facial expressions and body language? Okay, so like, I just, first of all, I just want to be really clear that I haven't played poker since 2012. So I'm going to say, where did I stand those days on uh, reading people's um, uh, expressions? So two things. Uh, thing number one is generally uh, the math is pretty wide. Um, so you're talking about pretty wide margins and your confidence. And so I think this is because I had a background in cognitive science. My confidence in saying I can see because you're doing that um, or something that that's going to tell me something about what you have is generally way too high. So the only time I would ever use that information is when the math is very, very tight. Right. So what I mean by that is let's say that I'm, uh, I'm going to win the pot 40 percent of the time. And uh, the math is telling me that I only have to win it 20% of the time to be profitable. In that case, I'm not even going to look at your face. I'm just like, well, I only have to win 20% of the time. And my math says I'm going to win 40% of the time. So I don't really need to resolve anything by looking at you. So then I'll just play. But if it's like, it says I have to win 40% of the time, and I think I'm right around 40% of the time, then I might go to that to try to get some information. Because otherwise, I'm going to assume I'm going to be way too overconfident about it. And in poker, Folding when you would have won uh, is a huge mistake. You're losing the whole pot. Whereas calling in the wrong spot is you're only losing a bet. So this is like false negative versus false positive. You would really vastly prefer false positives. I'd rather lose a bet than lose a pot with a false negative. Um, and so I'm always keeping that in mind. I don't want to do anything uh, to do that. And then the other thing is just if you stare at someone long enough, they'll look uncomfortable. <laughs> so. So in that sense, tells are only useful in like the first 15 seconds anyway. So because otherwise, once you're staring at them, they'll start doing things. You don't want to misinterpret those. We've, we've overlapped into, I think, a few professional sports teams. Can you give us the probability that the Eagles are going to finish the season undefeated? <laughs> well, it, I mean, you should bet against it. So uh, just by math. So what is there? There's, are there 12 games left? or? 11 10? games, 10 games? No, they've played five, right? So there's 11 games left, is that right? Six, right? Oh, they've played six? Six, 10 left. 10 left. OK, so I don't know. What do you think the probability in a given game is that I they mean, win on average? Probably as good as we look right now, 70%. Great. So multiple, go 70 times 70 times 70 times 70. Do that 10 times. And uh, you'll get the probability. It's pretty low. So just on the first two, 70 times 70, that they win the next two is only 49%. So let's start there, 
right? So that's just a conditional probability you have to multiply out. I was so hoping you would demonstrate how you think about that question. Okay, and same thing for the Super Bowl? Well, you have to get to the Super Bowl. So that's a little bit better, right? Because obviously, uh, ha undefeated so far, it's very likely that we get to the playoffs, right? So then you have to say, well, what are the, what's the probability that you win the playoff game? Um, that one would assume that we would bypass, we're favorites to bypass the wild card. So that's where you would start. We're probably like, given where our record is right now, we're probably, I'd guess, 80 or 90% to bypass the wild card. I mean, things would have to go super south. Um, so, and then you would, then you would take uh, the two games that you have to play to get to the Super Bowl. That's going to be a little harder. You're, you know, you're probably something like 60% to win both of those. So now you can multiply. Let's give it, be generous and say 90% no wild card game. So now you've got 90 times 60, probably times, you know, times 70, let's say times 60%, and then get to the Super Bowl and we'll figure out the odds then. So it's, it's just a simple conditional probability. This, this is actually really important in poker because people really underestimate. They forget that things are conditional. So when you're, if I say 70% in a game, people will automatically sort of think, oh, so we're 70% to be undefeated. Um, and you have to multiply these things out in order to get to the right answer. And if you don't do that, you will lose all your money. So, <laughs> so make sure you know what a conditional probability is. Here's an interesting one. Um, given that chess is higher skill than poker. No, it's not. <laughs> Sorry, results are more dependent on skill than poker. Thank you. Is what you said. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, why would one choose poker? Because people will gamble with you. So the problem <laughs> is that if, would you, would you bet money playing Rafael Nadal in tennis? In a, maybe in a decade or two. <laughs> okay, right. Like after he's hobbled around <laughs> or something, right? Today. Would you bet money? No. Like, would you bet money playing Gary Kasparov in chess? Of course not, right? Because you know what the outcome is. So here's the really great thing about cognitive bias if you're a professional poker player, is people will bet money against the best players in the world because there's a luck element. So they feel like they have a shot. And, and... <laughs> There's something called self-serving bias. And self-serving bias goes like this. When things go well, it's because I'm awesome. And when things go poorly, it's because I don't have, you know, because I got unlucky. So uh, an example of this right now is if I win an election, it's because I won. And if I lost an election, it's because I got cheated. Okay, so that's just self-serving bias, <laughs> like on a really big national scale. Okay. I was not going to so, ask you about your apprentice days, but go on. <laughs> I didn't say it about anybody. I was just saying in general that might, hypothetically, that would be an example of self-serving bias. So if you come in and you're an amateur and you're playing against a pro and you lose, what do you do? You say, well, I got really unlucky. And you can do that because you remember this one hand where like you had a better hand than me and maybe you were 60% to win and I just happened to hit a good card, which by the way is gonna happen 40% of the time. That's like Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. <laughs> It's a lot. But anyway, so you'll remember that and you'll say, I just got unlucky. And if you beat me, you'll think it's because you're great. And, and then you'll come back the next day because there's enough variance. So in things like poker, variance is your friend. If you're good at the game, it's your friend because people will actually bet money against you to play in a way that they wouldn't in other games. Okay, this makes me wonder, is this one of the few times when you could actually benefit from gender bias? Was it, easy, sure. was it easier for you to hustle people because they underestimated you as a woman? Absolutely. But the flip side of that was, uh, you know, not safe for, <laughs> I can't say things like they, they, uh, the things that people were, would say in a situation where there is no HR department. So, you know, you had to focus on the good stuff and sort of try to push away the bad stuff that was happening. Um, another question related to that is, do you have recommendations for how to get other people to walk away from their biases? Uh, so I actually do, particularly in, in, the, in the case of quitting. So one of the things that's really hard is that people always feel like they can turn it around. Um, that's a little bit has to do with over-optimism, but it also has a little bit to do with wanting to rationalize away this moment that you're facing of failing, going from failing to having failed, that's a really tough moment for all of us, right? Like the minute that you abandon the cause is the minute that it can never work out for you. Like you're never gonna finish the marathon or get up the mountain or have success in that particular job or you know whatever, right? So, so that's a really tough moment for us. So when you go to somebody, let's say you see that they're like 
there's a project they, that they should shut down or a job that they're really unhappy with. When you go to them and you say, geez, it seems like things aren't going well, they're going to tell you they can turn it around. And my advice is agree with them because they haven't given you permission to do otherwise. So if they haven't given you permission, you know, you don't want to that person is like, you should really break up with them, you know, and then you're, they're like, what? And then they're not your friend anymore because they didn't give you permission to say it. So I'm not recommending that. So you just say things like things aren't going well. And you're like, I know, but like I'm thinking about it, but I really think I can turn around. Agree with them. But then what you do is you say, so like, how long are you okay with this? So you sort of flip that script on the kill criteria. How long are you okay with this? And they'll tell you like, oh, I think I can take this for like, you know, three more months. And you say, great. Well, like, okay, so I'm there with you, bud. You know, that's awesome. So what do you think it looks like in three months? Like, what does success look like? What, what, are, you, what are the benchmarks you have to hit or, or how things might things change? What are the things that would tell you that nothing's changed enough for, for you to still stick with what's going on? Write those things down, figure them out, say, so what do you think you could do that would help you to get to those outcomes? Uh, write that stuff down and say, all right, I'll see you in three months and we'll talk about it. And that will help people get to the decision faster. Now, I want to be really clear that you see it in that moment, right? If, if you, you know, if they were objective, you're probably being pretty objective. It would be correct for them to quit right then, but they're not going to do it. So instead, what you're trying to do is save them time. In other words, if you don't have this intervention, this might go on for a year or more. Right. And that's something that we have to think about. It's not a waste of those three months. It's a savings of however long past those three months they would have stayed in it. And it also maintains your relationship with them, which is also really good. Yeah. At that point, at the three month mark, I just want to ask, can I record this conversation and play it back to you so that you sure. can hear? We had the same conversation three months ago. Right, exactly. And that's what you're trying to avoid because that otherwise that's what happens is, they, oh, can we turn it around? And they say yes. And, and then you see them in three months and it's the exact same thing. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is on rinse and repeat. And that will go on for a really, really long time. So by doing this, you can kind of short circuit it, you know, and that, that's something that I think is really important, you know, and, and it's so, like Ron Conway from SV Angel, who is one of the most successful angel investors. This is a strategy that he would use with his portfolio founders. You know, it just to, because what he would say is like, life is so short and these people are so brilliant. And the fact that I can see that they're working on something that isn't going to work out is it's criminal because they're so smart. They could go do something that would actually change the world. And if he could get them there a little faster, he just felt like it was such a huge win. And I think that's how we have to approach these kinds of problems. I want to get your take on the morality of quitting. Um, I think we, we talked about peer pressure a little bit earlier as a bad thing. But, excuse me, I think there are certain situations where other people are counting on you, and that's an important commitment or responsibility. And if we could take an extreme example. Before she got canceled, I was extremely mad at J.K. Rowling for retiring from writing Harry Potter books. Um, whole generation worldwide was motivated to read. We also know that learning about muggles reduced prejudice. Um, these books are a massive net positive in the world, and I think she's a bad person for saying, I'm not going to write them anymore. Um, I felt the same way watching Serena and Roger Federer retire. I'm like, no, you owe us more tennis. Like, keep playing. I do not want this to end. And I, I think those are obviously extreme examples, um, but I stand by everything I just said. And the question, the question is, like, when do you say those are, those are meaningful responsibilities and I should live up to those commitments? Yeah, so um, the commitment to your children to your parents, parents to children, maybe you've made commitments to friends, maybe you've made a, a commitment to your work to stick around for a certain time. You obviously have to honor those commitments from a moral standpoint, right? Like one of the things that I just partially as a poker player really hate is something called retrading, which is you make an agreement, you make a commitment, and then I come back and try to change, change the rules on you all of a sudden. And, uh, in poker, it expresses like this, like, let's say I back you in a tournament and it's a one time shot. So I ha literally have taken on all the risk because there's no way for me to get my money back if you lose. Um, and I say, OK, I'm going to give you 30 percent of the winnings if you win the tournament. That would actually be quite a generous deal under those circumstances. You win the tournament and you come back and you say, I should get 60 because I won. Ugh. So um, so I just have a very like the kind of do that. Oh, all the time. Are you kidding? They're like, where's my bonus? I won the tournament. It's like, oh my gosh. Um, let me try to explain this to you again. We had an agreement. Um, I had all the risk. Uh, so, you know, but this happens all the time, right? So, um, so you have to honor those. And that goes into what are your values, right? What are the things that you've committed to? What are your values? Now, when it comes to your own personal decisions, like Federer, Serena, 
you be you. But what I think is really interesting is just in the case for ourselves, that we want to butt up against a dead certainty to the point where, like, at the point that we're willing to quit, it's, it's kind of no longer a choice anymore because we have to be so sure that we, we can't turn it around before we're willing to walk away. This is how people die on the top of Mount Everest, obviously. Um, that for people that we think that we're getting some benefit from, like Serena or, um, or Federer or whoever, when they quit before we're sure that they have to, we also get really upset. Right, so we can take Seinfeld, Barry Sanders. People are still mad about that. Lions fan here. Yeah, like, ruin like, ruin my childhood. Right, like what are you doing, right? But the thing is, like Seinfeld, I think expressed it really well. So, uh, you know, we kind of, but we kind of mock people for sticking around too long. Like you should, you know, if you hear the talk about Tom Brady uh, the other day or, or or Aaron Rodgers, you can see this feeling of like, what an idiot! Why are you still playing? Now you've really jumped the shark. Ugh. So we're putting people in that position if they stick around until it is actually certain that they don't really have a choice, that it's time for them to walk away. We're a little bit like, oh, you're so dumb. Why didn't you quit before that? But when they do quit before that, we get mad because we really would rather get the certainty that there's really no other choice. And sort of like parents with kids, we're very tied into Federer. We're very tied, tied into Serena. I'm not really tied into Djokovic. I just want to say that. <laughs> so, I don't know if anyone is. But. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, you know, and, and now I think we're all like starting to get really into Alvarez, right? And like, so we become very identified. They become kind of part of our tribe. And then we're mad when they quit too soon, at least. And what too soon in this case means is just before we know for sure that they have to. But what we have to remember is that they have values too, things that they value. And maybe they don't want to be there for the decline. Maybe this is the, they know that they're on the top of the world and they can feel for themselves. Like, I don't want to be here when it starts going bad. And that's their value. And they're allowed to do that because they don't actually have a commitment to you, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Very disappointing. Yes. We'll try to fix that in the future. Annie, in closing, is there a piece of quitting advice you haven't given yet that we would all benefit from? Yes. Uh, okay. So the piece of quitting advice I, I would give is that, uh, again, thinking in advance, what, one of the things that we know is if we collect all of this cognitive debris that makes it really hard for us to quit, what we should do is approach projects to reduce that co cognitive debris. And I think one of the best mental models to help you do this is called Monkeys and Pedestals. It comes from, uh, I know, right, Astro Teller, um, who is the CEO of X, which is Google's in-house innovation hub. Um, his official title is Captain of Moonshots. Um, and he's thinking about this all the time because they're doing really big bets, right? They want to, uh, their motto is 10x better in five to 10 years to commercialization. Uh, but even Google has limited resources. So they're trying to make sure that they're really spending their time on the stuff that really might change the world and quitting all the other stuff really quickly. Okay, so he's obsessed with this idea. Um, so monkeys and pedestals goes like this. If you have decided you want to make money uh, by training a monkey to juggle flaming torches while standing on a pedestal in the town square, that would make a lot of money, right? You'd, put, you'd throw money in the hat there. Um, would I? I hope so. I mean, that would be pretty cool of monkey fl juggling flaming torches. I'd like that. Well, they're standing on pedestal. Wait for it to be on YouTube, but go on. There you go. Um, uh, you should not build the pedestal first. You should see if you can train that monkey to juggle. Why? Because what's the point? There, like literally, like there's no point in building the pedestal if you can't train the monkey to juggle the flaming torches. Because the unknown, the thing that you're trying to prove out, the hard part of the problem, the bottleneck in this particular system, or the reverse salient to be like super nerdy, um, is whether you can actually get that uh, monkey to juggle, right? The pedestal you should only do after you've already figured out that hard thing first, uh, particularly because you already know you can do it. So when you do do that, it's actually the illusion of pro progress, but you've put effort and money and time into it that starts to co collect like sunk costs. So that if you do that first and then you butt up against, oh, this monkey's really hard to train, you'll keep going at it even so. So there's a really good example that's been in the news of this, of the California bullet train. I don't know if you've been reading about this, but they floated a bond in 2010 for $9 billion. Uh, the idea is to connect San Francisco to LA uh, by high speed rail. So they have to go through the Central Valley. The first piece of track they approved was on flat land between Madero and Fresno. We know we can build track on flat land, everybody. Now, somewhere around 2016, so this is six years into the project, $33 million projected budget up until this point, they say, oh no, 
we have a problem we have just now suddenly discovered, which is there are two mountain ranges, one to the south of San Francisco called the Diablo Range, and the other to the north of uh, LA, which is the Tehachapi Mountains. I hate when mountains just sprout up. Right, <laughs> they just appeared. <laughs> And they're in seismically active areas. So this is not a small engineering problem to figure out, can you blast through these mountains and have trains safely go through a place that's in an earthquake zone? OK, so they finally figured this out in 2016. Immediately, the budget explodes to $80 billion. They go to Newsom, Governor Newsom, and they say, what do you want to do now? He said, well, we can't stop now, because that would be a waste of taxpayer money, $7 billion of it at this point. Um, so what we're going to do is build track between Bakersfield and Merced, which is on flat land in the Central Valley. And then what we'll do right after that is we'll build track between San Francisco and Silicon Valley, which is to the north of Di Diablo Ranch, also on flat land. So what are they doing? They're just building pedestals because they didn't think about the monkey first. Because if they had, you would have just gone ahead and done an engineering feasibility study before you started doing anything, right? Uh, but now that they've built this money and they've spent, at this point, $9 billion of taxpayer money, they say, we can't stop because we'll have wasted the money. Meanwhile, the budget has now exploded to over $100 billion. Now, as Astro Teller would say, oh, you should stop now and save that $100 billion, right? Uh, but what, he, what they're saying is we can't waste the, the taxpayer money that we've already spent, so they aren't shutting it down. So uh, I think uh, approach your projects, say, what are the monkeys, identify those first, and make sure you're tackling those before you do what everybody does in project planning, because you know this happens. People say, well, what's the low-hanging fruit? Let's do that first. Those are pedestals. That is the wrong way to approach problems. Well, Annie, I think it's safe to say that no one in the audience quit on your insights. And oh. no, one, no one is going to give up on the book. Either. I hope not. They're going to make it all the way through. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. I think the next time you come to Penn, it will be as Dr. Duke. Yes, we look it forward will be. to it. it will thank be you, as Annie. Dr. Duke. Thank you. I clap for you too.